The Court of Common Pleas in Pennsylvania goes back all the way to 1776. But you have to wonder if they've ever had a case more horrific than the capital murder trial of abortion doctor Kermit Gosnell. So a strong viewer warning is in order. The story we're about to tell is grim. The Kermit Gosnell case is a landmark legal battle about race, class, and the reality of abortion in America. But the details are appalling. They're set out in this 281-page grand jury report that summed up its allegations against Gosnell on page one, paragraph one. Quote, he regularly and illegally delivered live, viable babies in the third trimester of pregnancy and then murdered these newborns by severing their spinal cords with scissors. Over the years, many people came to know that something was going on here, but no one put a stop to it. Several of Gosnell's employees testified that this happened, and some pleaded guilty to murdering babies. As I speak, a Philadelphia jury has not yet decided the fate of Kermit Gosnell, whose controversial career began a half century ago at the dawn of the abortion rights movement. Kermit Gosnell was born in Philadelphia in 1941. Raised in a working class black neighborhood, he was a striver. From his humble beginnings, he'd ultimately go on to graduate from Philadelphia's Jefferson Medical College in 1966. The 60s and early 70s were heady days for a generation pushing social and political change. And Kermit Gosnell, MD, fit right in, says author and Fox News executive editor Peter Boyer. He was the expression, the ultimate expression, you could argue, of the civil rights movement. But he was also on the edge of an almost radical vein of thought when it came to what he called women's health issues, which became a kind of euphemism for the abortion rights movement. May 1972, the Supreme Court had heard arguments in an historic abortion case, but it would be months before the actual Roe v. Wade decision. One pro-abortion women's health group dreamed up an outrageous piece of political theater ahead of the court's decision. They reached out to Kermit Gosnell, who had trained at a New York abortion clinic before returning to Philadelphia. He became uh, consequently uh, involved in this, one of the weirdest and darkest uh, episodes in uh, the abortion rights movement. An episode that would ultimately become the subject of a U.S. Senate hearing on human experimentation. The story begins in Chicago, where abortion was illegal. The women's group chartered a bus to drive 15 poor, pregnant women in their second trimester to Philadelphia, where abortion law was ambiguous. There, the next day, Mother's Day, Kermit and another doctor performed free abortions on all of them, with TV cameras rolling. The television footage is lost. Only newspaper accounts survived. They report that Gosnell was using something called a super coil. The super coil was an experimental medical device meant to be inserted into the uterus of a woman who was pregnant and gradually as the super coil heated up to body temperature it would expand and start really lacerating, tearing, cutting, causing bleeding. Dr. Sidney Wolf, one of Ralph Nader's consumer watchdogs, was appalled by the stunt. They were never told that this is an experiment. They were never told some of the known dangers about it. Dr. Gosnell's license should have been yanked then. Nine of the 15 women suffered complications. Three ended up in the hospital. The episode became known as the Mother's Day Massacre. When the Senate held its hearing a year later, Gosnell issued a defiant statement, casting himself as one doctor who actually did something for women's health, rather than just talk about it. Of the Mother's Day abortions, Gosnell wrote, quote, it would have been irresponsible not to respond to these women. After Roe v. Wade made abortion a constitutional right, Gosnell would make a career out of performing them, even though he was never certified as an obstetrician or gynecologist. Kermit Gosnell was a failed physician. Dr. Mark Siegel of the Fox Medical A team. He didn't make it through a residency. You'd be scrambling. You'd be trying to get a career together. What do I do? What do I do? You find a role 
If it works for you, you keep doing it. It worked. Before the 70s were over, he'd opened the augustly named Women's Medical Society at 38th Street and Lancaster Avenue in West Philadelphia, complete with the silhouette of a couple swinging a child between them. The community, the neighbors around the clinic, loved Dr. Gosnell, and they said he was a very respected, um, upstanding member of their community, and he was known for just his reputation in the community. Documentarian Jen Thompson made a short film about Gosnell called 3801 Lancaster. We've had people tell us that if they had a problem, Dr. Gosnell was the one to go to. But his clinic operated on the shady side from the beginning suggests Philadelphia District Attorney Seth Williams. The doctor was not a board certified obstetrician or gynecologist. They used the name of another physician who was board certified to open the clinic. Government health officials, however, didn't seem to care. Prosecutor Ann Ponterio. We found that the first inspection was done in 1978 and it was good for a year to 1979. The second inspection was not done for 10 years later to 1989. When they did inspect, they found significant problems, like not having licensed nurses on staff. But authorities looked the other way. In 1993 was the last time for the approval. In over 17 years, no one set foot in that clinic. And no one did any annual inspections. And no one went out for any complaints. The grand jury would learn one reason why that happened, politics. Syndicated columnist and Fox News contributor Kirsten Powers. Testimony done by a Department of Health top official recounted a meeting under the administration of new governor Tom Ridge. They decided that they did not want to inspect these abortion clinics because it would be putting up a barrier to access of abortions to women. Governor Ridge's administration was concerned that if they did routine inspections, they would find too many violations. Meanwhile, Gosnell's clinic became stunningly profitable. Prosecutors estimate he was taking in $15,000 a night, close to $2 million a year in cash. And he kept costs low at his ill-equipped clinic with an untrained staff. And he had them doing jobs that are for professionals. He had them doing ultrasounds. There was a 15-year-old who was hired to work at the clinic. Dr. Gosnell gave her a science textbook which she read for 20 minutes, and she became an anesthesiologist. Another key employee went to a Caribbean medical school, but was never licensed to practice. There was a, a doctor who had gone to a school in Grenada, and after the clinic was closed, he became a, um, a telemarketer. Dr. Gosnell wasn't even there during the day. What he would do is he would have these untrained, unlicensed staff monitoring these women, and then he would come there at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night, and he would have these abortions performed throughout the night till 3 o'clock in the morning. And that's just the beginning. According to prosecutors in their case against Gosnell, his women's medical society was much worse than an incompetently run clinic. It was a home to butchery and murder, plain and simple. After the break. <laughs>